The following program is brought to you by Fanbags Cornhole, Chicago's official supplier of professional cornhole boards and bags. Choose from any of their officially licensed designs or have my boy Brian design a custom set using anything from a selfie to your company's logo. Visit www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS to get 10% off your entire order. That's www.fanbagscornhole and use the promo code BRAGS for 10% off. Step up your game with Fanbags Cornhole. It's Zach Eady with Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to Boilers in the Stands post-game show. I am your host, Greg Braggs Jr. Alongside me, as always, is our guys, Joe Jackson and Craig Bowers. Um, Purdue wins convincingly at the end, but not so convincing at halftime. Only up nine and definitely had Purdue fans, you know, um, a little sketched out. You could feel it in the stadium. I'm sure you probably felt it at home a little bit. Nine points, certainly not a comfortable lead, but they come out guns a-blazing to start the second half, really started to lock the clamps down defensively and did a nice job in that regard, and we're going to get into all of that. And then, of course, Zach Eady, you know, uh, who's about to be the two-time National Player of the Year. They had absolutely – no answer for him. Grambling State, that being said, they had no answer for Zach Eady. Both their bigs in foul trouble all night long to the point where Zach's got a couple new scars on his arm. Uh, he had a little chokehold takedown that resulted in a flagrant foul in the first half. And uh, Braden Smith coming out the gates, you know, and really, you know, he had three three pointers to start the game. And I think from, you know, an execution standpoint, they played pretty loose and did what they wanted to do. If you're going to talk about the nerves, which I certainly, you know, I'm I'm always monitoring the nerves. I think we're at the free throw line here tonight, Uh, but at halftime, they were shooting 40% from the free throw line. And I think that was a big part of the reason why Grambling State was keeping it close, uh, missing some one and ones. I mean, those are big turns, you know, where two points turns into zero points and then Grambling comes the other way and makes some buckets, you know, and 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 Purdue, as they always do, allowing the mid-range game. And, and I thought Grambling did a really nice job of shooting with confidence here tonight. So credit to them for making it interesting for a half. But at the end of the day, Purdue did what they had to do in the second half and did what all one seeds do to 16 seeds, and that's take care of business and ultimately won the game by over 26 and a half. There was a guy behind me completely losing his mind when Carson Barrett knocked down the three. He had the under. Purdue gets the over, and the man loses his money. But good for Carson Barrett to hit his final, maybe what could be his final shot of his playing career here at Purdue. You never know here as we go down the road, but a nice shot to finish the game. So, Craig, I'll start with you. Your instant reaction here to the Boilermakers win over Grambling State. You know, well, the, 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 the players in um, the press conference were asked about what it felt like to just kind of get through this first tournament win and after sitting in it for an entire year. And Zach Eady very 
abruptly said they just did what they were supposed to do and they don't want any praise for that. Um, it was very obvious to when Painter was asked about it, too. He was just ready for that question to be done being asked. Uh, said something about, I know you guys are doing your job, but the toughest thing is having to ask quest or answer questions about it all the time for our players. But with that said, I'm going to go ahead and give that answer for him. Um, I, I think there was a lot of relief from everybody. Um, I, I felt like you could just see a little bit of weight of getting getting through that first game, a little bit of weight shedding. Um, especially in the second half when they took off and really started to stretch out the lead and Lance doing what Lance does and getting the crowd into it and just getting everybody engaged. I think everybody loosened up from that point on. Uh, you saw TKR who missed a, quite a few bunnies early on. You saw Lance in his first tournament game miss some shots that he normally hits. And you just felt like that pressure start to lift a little bit. And I think that's huge. And as we go into game two, um, now you've got three guys who who played in their first NCAA tournament games ever in Heidi Colvin and TKR that are going to come out with that one game experience. They, that initial pressure and nervousness and all that stuff that comes with it. Um, it's gone, right? Uh, they get a walk into game two as, as somebody that's won a game in the NCAA tournament and they can just come out and play free and play loose. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. We were talking about that at our meetup and shout out to everybody that came up to the meetup. I know we were all joking about the establishment we picked out, but Hooters is literally a uh, block down the road from here, walking distance. And there was a lot of space and opportunity. Uh, there was around 20 people that came out here uh, to hang out with us and show some support for what we do on this show. So please hit that like button and subscribe, but shout out to those guys. Um, we appreciate every single one of you that tune into this show. Uh, but yeah, you're a hundred percent right. You know, uh, getting, shaking the nerves, uh, was certainly a big part of it. And we'll get into more of that. Joe, your instant reaction, please. <sighs> that's, that's, that's the initial instant reaction for me. Just it's done. It's over. We can move on. Um, yes, there was a little bit of concern at, at the midway point. Um, but even that was more of just like, uh, Purdue was just missing some of the little things. Grambling was, was hitting some, um, shots that Purdue was fine giving up. They knocked him down. They didn't knock him down in the second half. There was some adjustments, but the, the, it's just a deep breath. You can move on. And then the second thing is we will, we as, as this is what we do, right? We'll talk about this game and, and the little things and all that stuff. At the end of the day, this game doesn't mean anything for the next one. It, it means absolutely zero for the next one. Obviously, Edie's dominant. That's great. Brain plays pretty well. Good. Um, but guys, good or bad, it, it doesn't matter for the next game. It, it is six single, uh, it's a six single game elimination tournament. Like, Next game is a whole new tournament. It's a whole new game, um, and you got to play 40 minutes for that one. But at the end of the day, still very good. Get this off the backs. And now just whatever cloud there was, whether I, I know Purdue did a good job of just being like, yeah, it's there. Who cares? Um, we're we're going to do what we do. It's gone. So that still just does feel good in general, I would say. I would push back a little bit on you here, Joe. Um, I agree every game is its own entity, but when you talk about momentum and nerves and energy, um, you know, Painter even addressed it in his opening statement saying, you know, they had three guys on this roster that had never played in an NCAA tournament game, uh, that being uh, Miles Colvin, Camden Heidi, and Lance Jones. Then when you also add in the fact that Fletcher Lawyer – and Braden Smith are only in their second tournament game, their first being a loss to Fairley Dickinson, Trey Kaufman, Red included. So to get that monkey off their back, I think was a big sigh of relief. And then on the other aspect of it too is, you know, because in the first half, the other team had a chance to, you know, win, you know, and make this game competitive. Grambling State, I don't care what anybody says. Somebody in the chat was like, nine points was more than enough at halftime. No. I don't think that I, I don't care what you say. Uh, there was nerves everywhere in the stadium. And so maybe that's going to creep into next game where teams are going to, I want Purdue to be the underdog. So to me, did they win convincingly enough that people are going to think, Oh, well, they're going to win going away, going in the sweet 16. Hell no. Uh, everyone is, is going to be picking Purdue to lose because they, everybody just wants to constantly find the flaws in this team or look, at what they uh, perceive as the flaws in this team. And so I kind of like the fact that, you know, it gives Purdue something to work on. They, like, you know, you know, you can't work on free throws any more than you can. I mean, they, they're just missing them. But, like, to me, Zach Eady did have some nerves at the free throw line, so maybe he can relax a little bit now that they have this game under their belt. 
Uh, and then the other aspect of it too, I wasn't going to lead the show with it, but I also think from a fan standpoint, and this is a fan in the stand show. This is what we talk about. You know, Joe's the analytical guy and Craig gives that big picture perspective, but I'm always going to give it from the fan in the stands perspective. And I know a lot of you boiler fans that are going to tune in the show that we're at the game. I, I, I think that we all need to do a better job of being, being ready ourselves as fans and, you know, waiting for this team to constantly go on, you know, three go on runs where they make three baskets in a row and get three stops in a row, you know, Grambling States fans for the entire first half were much louder than Purdue's fans and Purdue's fans were outnumbering Grambling by 20, 50 to one, hundred to one. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, how much the stadium capacity holds, but Grambling had one section so I also think there was a, a a lot of nervous energy and tension in the in the crowd to start the game, and that gives the other team confidence. I mean, I don't want to hear about how Mackey Arena is the toughest place to play and then act like crowd energy has no bearing on a game. It does. I do not like if you don't agree with me, fine, but you're not. I do not agree. And so from my standpoint, one of my biggest issues was everybody sitting on their hands in the first half. It was as quiet as a church in this stadium today. And I beg and plead every fan that's coming out here. This is your shot as a Purdue fan. This is home court advantage. This is as close to being playing at Mackey for a tournament game as you're possibly going to get. And I just implore you, I understand it's nerve wracking. I understand what's at stake. I understand that Purdue has a long history of embarrassing tournament losses. Support your team. Support these guys. These are the last times you're going to see Zach Eady, Mason Gillis, Ethan Morton, Carson Barrett, you know, all these guys. Like, I just, for me as a fan in the stands, I just want Sunday for everybody to bring it. Don't wait for the run. Get up, get loud for every defensive possession. I don't care what the score is. I, I, I just can't emphasize that enough. It was one of my biggest issues at the end of last year's you know game. And I know everybody's like, well, let's talk about the game. I want to talk about the game. And these guys will. And they're going to do a great job breaking down the whys. But from me and my standpoint, let's come on, guys. Like, this is it. Get loud, man. Don't be afraid of the moment. The team was not afraid of the moment. They, they were some nerves at the free throw line, but at the end of the day, Fletcher played with confidence. Braden would play with confidence. Zach Eady played with confidence. Give your team the same confidence as the fan in the stands. I'm sorry. It sounds silly. I understand it sounds silly, but I truly believe in this. And so from my standpoint, now that those nerves, when you talk about this game has nothing to do with next, I disagree because I just think now that this game's out of the way, we can go into Sunday, put that behind us, and now let's get crazy here and turn this into the Mackey Arena environment that it's supposed to be on Sunday. Rant over. I was just going to add, um, is the comment here was also a hassle getting in the game, which didn't help the energy. It didn't off rip. Um, that you 100% nailed it, Shelly, and I forgot to add that in the rant. The, I understand that the, the facility has a responsibility to clear the stadium out, clean all the garbage, get everybody out and then get the new people in. But it created this problem. It was a serious problem where you had thousands of fans trying to pack it in through four doorways and the game is 19 minutes away from starting. And so from a TV standpoint, they had to tip the game. They delayed it by like 25 minutes, but it wasn't enough time for the people that paid money to come to this game to get in their seats. And so that was a huge disadvantage. So I'll be monitoring how they handle this here on Sunday because that was an, also a huge element to it. So you're 100% right, Shelly. took forever for everybody to get into their seats, get their food, get their drink, get whatever they're trying to do, and sit down and get into the game. So I agree with that, Shelly. That was a big miss, and I'm sure they lost a lot of money, you know, because fans are trying to get in and spend money. So, like, I that that's a good point by Shelly. Yeah, no doubt. I, 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 Quit messing with my mute, Braggs, and just let I me do you. it on my, on my just let me do it on my mic myself. Um, no, I. So one thing that I would say is I, I've probably traveled to the away games more than than Joe or Greg over the last three years as we've done this. And the one team that has had some NCAA tournament success from the Big Ten is Michigan State. 
And the one thing that I always notice when I'm up there is anytime Purdue would get up seven, eight, nine, ten points, Michigan State fans would stand up and start cheering for Michigan State. They would cheer for them when they were having a tough time, when they were down. And if there is one little gripe that I do have is that I don't see that nearly as much um, uh, from the Purdue side. So I would just reiterate that from from Greg, um, especially maybe when they're struggling instead of starting to hear those collective groans. Let's let's get up and throw some support behind them as we try to make this stretch run down here. I, I don't think we can wait any longer, Greg, without talking about Zach Eady going for, uh, you know, 30, whatever and 20, whatever. Um, double, double. It's, I think the second time in the last 50 years, it's the first time since 1995 and only the third time in NCAA tournament history for a 30, 20 double, double. Um, and we, we talk about Zach, but there's a lot of times we kind of gloss over because we just expect Zach to do Zach things. And I think we've got to lead off with that here today because there's been a lot of talk about like, can, can Purdue be successful in the tournament when you're going to play through a big man, even if he is a two-time national player of the year, big man. And he came out and made a big statement today that if you're going to try to just send three or four different guys at me and, and be physical with me, and there were a lot of fouls that weren't called today and he did not get frustrated and he's going to have to do that all tournament because they're going to run into some refs that aren't going to call all the contact and he's got to keep a level head. He's got to play through it and he's still got to figure out a way to be a dominant force for this team. And he absolutely did that today. And, and a, for a guy who set records just left and right up and down for this program tonight is just one more big feather in his cap and just an absolutely dominant performance today. And also like, um, there we go. Also, just like I think one of the big things at halftime was um, Grambling was hitting a lot of these mid range jumpers. And they're, they're, some of them were tough. Some of them was just kind of um, honestly also on Purdue's guards of just not being able to get through the screens well enough in that. Uh, but at the same time, Edie, that second half, and, and Morris Bankston, um, at, at, he, he, he put out the tweet um, how Edie was playing a little bit higher in that second half. He's a little bit higher in drop coverage. Um, so he's near, near the free throw line instead of maybe a couple feet below. Just little adjustments, right? Like Edie's not, we're, we're, ne we're never going to say Edie's going, can just like switch onto the perimeter and stuff, although he's been better. But he's more um, versatile even within his coverages now. And so he's two steps higher. And you just saw, you saw Grambling, they were still taking tougher shots, but they just had to work a lot harder too to get them. Um, it, it was, you know, they were winding, they, they wanted to slow the game down um, and that's what they did. But at the same time, like they had to work that much harder in the second half. So in addition to Edie, literally, I mean, Edie had 21 rebounds and Grambling at 23, like, that we we could have just said that and then probably ended the show and, and it would have been a good show. Um, but in, in addition to all that, like what he brings defensively for this team can never ever be be overstated. And so that's when like there's you know and and I get it's just Twitter discourse and all that. But you have the is can Dalton Connect beat um, Edie for National Player of the Year? Can can this guy or what? It's gen generally like maybe if you look at one side of the ball, there's a there there can at least be somewhat of a case. Um, but in terms of two ways, like it's hard to find it's nobody's more productive on offense. And there are very, very few people that are more important defensively in the country. Like it, it's just crazy what he can do. Um, just, yeah, I, I just wanted to call that out to in addition dominant down low and all that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and Zach Eady becomes the first player in NCAA history to reach 800 points, 400 rebounds, 50 assists and 50 blocks in a single season the first player ever in NCAA history to do that. So that's a big deal. And so, um, yeah, it, it like you can't be understated. You're good. Um, you, it can't be understated, the dominance of Zach Eady and just how special he is. And he shows that on a daily basis. Um, and Purdue fans are very lucky. We're all very lucky to watch him play on a daily basis. So um, we're in a, just for everybody to get a little behind the scenes here, we're in a conference room here in the belly of um, Gamebridge Fieldhouse. And so that's why like we're kind of messing with our mics because we're all, normally we're not all in the same room. So we are all literally sitting at the same table right now, trying to mute our mics individually as each of us talk. So you guys don't hear an echo on your end. And then some guy walked in because we didn't really get any permission to be in this room. Wink, wink. But 
you know, we're cool. It's all good. We're doing a uh, Boilers in the Stands post game show, and we appreciate everybody tuning in. David Jenkins, I thought you were in a restroom. No, because it was either do it in a private room or do it in the media room. So we're doing it up. Uh, you know, we're trying to do the best post game show we can for you guys, and and try to get this, you know, bow wrap before halftime. Um, you know, res- you know, before the second half resumes of the I want to- uh, TCU game, Utah State. But uh, we appreciate everybody hanging out. Please hit that like button once again and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, we'll move into the next segment here of our show. Um, but first I want to, uh, let's give a shout out here to autograph and then we'll, um, you know, round second here on boilers in the stands post game show. As long as I didn't, uh, throw you guys a curveball here on boilers in the stands, you guys are good to go. Um, all right. Well, fire away, my friends. Yeah. So again, just. Access blogs. Was it dead? You're fine. Good lord. Start over? Sure. We'll start <laughs> over. <laughs> this is, we are having technical difficulties. I, I like, you told me to let you control my mute. So I was like, well, yeah, but then you muted on your mic. Good lord, people. Joe, go ahead. This is what we're doing here. This is, this is a, a mega work. Right. So. Autograph. If for anybody that couldn't hear, Craig was talking, you know, saying some great stuff about autograph, <laughs> um, which I heard because I'm sitting three feet from him. Um, but not you guys, did, unfortunately, did not get to hear. So I'll talk a little bit about autograph. That an app that you know over the past couple months has come out, and it gives you all your your sports content in one specific spot. And what I mean by that, right? Because what how is that different from like ESPN app or whatever? It's it is your Purdue specific content from across many sites, and it's not also just big name stuff, right? You obviously you'll get some of the big name stuff in there, but um, um, and boilerball accounts and all that, but you'll find like our podcast on there, or your, you know, um, a lot of the other just you know kind of beat writer type uh, podcasts, articles, whatever that that you listen to in one specific app. Um, so, you know, we we do appreciate them working with us. They are doing a lot of kind of giveaways. They've given out multiple tickets for this this round of sixty four game that we just saw. They've done multiple things for the round of thirty two game coming up Sunday. Um, so just yeah, really appreciate them working with us and, and just um, excited to to be able to be partnered with them. Craig, I don't know if you you had anything with that. Yeah, again, just to reiterate, uh, an app that I absolutely love in, in terms of just it rewards you for doing what you're already doing. Um, Listen to the podcast you already listen to. Read the articles you already read. Just do it through the app, um, and it rewards you for that. Um, awesome free ticket packages coming up for round of 32, and also um, elite VIP uh, elite eight packages that will be rolling out as well. So use the code BITS. Uh, scan that QR code. Go sign up if you're not already on, and enjoy your Purdue content all from one site. Yep. I want to, so use code bits. Um, and before we transition to the next part, I wanted to throw this in when you were talking about the behind the scenes is like, how do you guys have so much better lighting than me? Like, I don't get it. I've been trying to figure this out for 10 minutes and and you guys just have so much better lighting, but let's get back to the actual game. What we are here for Purdue 78 over 50 from grambling, um, big second half. We talked about Edie. Um, and obviously we could talk about Edie, we, it's the issue of we could talk about Edie for two minutes and we could also try and talk about Edie for two hours. Um, I want to shout out. I mean, we got to go to Braden Smith next, probably 11 points, 10 assists. He had a couple big time threes also in the first half just to kind of calm things down a little bit. Five rebounds, no turnovers, 10 assists and no turnovers is wild. I don't really care who you play. Um, I don't care if it's grambling. I don't care if it's, you know, whoever else they like 10 assists to zero turnovers is is pretty crazy when he has the ball in his hands that much uh, able to create for others he's able to knock down shots i also think his defense much was much much better in the second half uh in that first half you saw him so what they were doing it's called icing or weaking and so on those pick and rolls right he's guarding number double zero dozier he's just forcing him to his weekend every single time now 
what Dozier was doing a good job of was just kind of creating that little bit of separation on the drive. And that's where you saw a lot of those mid range come. And then he eventually even turned them into drives where he just went straight at Edie. Um, now Edie playing a little bit higher. And then you also saw brain just be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, I think getting into the ball a little bit more too, um, especially after the first couple minutes of the second half. So just, I thought it was a pretty good all around game. You're hoping maybe he hits another three and goes four or nine instead of three and nine in terms of pure percentages. But at the end of the day, um, an 11 point, 10 assists, zero turnover outing from Brain Smith. I'll, I'll take that every single game. If that's going to happen, um, Purdue's going to have a very good chance of, of going far in this tournament. Yeah. And Zach in the post game press conference was asked about him, about how much easier uh, Braden makes the job for everybody else that's on the floor. And he just, he led with, um, you know, 11 assists, zero turnovers. That's insane. That would that was his statement is like, I don't think you guys understand how insane of a stat that is um, unless you've played college basketball. So he was incredible today. We we talked kind of in the pregame, Joe, about this team being a team that does force a decent high percentage of turnovers uh, per possession in terms of them statistically. Obviously, that has a little bit to do with what conference they play in. Um, but you expected to see some turnovers in this game. Purdue still kept it, um, I think, at 10. Uh, some of them they forced on some big men when they got the ball and got it down a little bit too low. A couple of them were a couple of them, not a lot, not near the Wisconsin game. A couple of them were still just kind of unforced uh, issues out there, um, but they certainly cleaned that up quite a bit since the Wisconsin game. Yeah, you're you're 100 percent right. Some of them were definitely unforced rushing, you know, inlet passes that went awry, you know, and so, you know, these guys, you know, I just think needed to settle down a little bit. And then, and then they did in the second half. Uh, we look at some of the splits here. Uh, this was the second half. Um, eight of 29 for Grambling in the second half. 25%, um, you know, at 25% from three-point land as well. Uh, 15 of 27, only 33% for Purdue. So, I mean, the story was definitely in the second half because Purdue just kind of put the clamps on. Um, and Grambling was 100% from the free throw line in the second half. Um, you know, they started to, you know, they went five of eight in the second half as well. So um, five turnovers for Purdue, only two for Grambling. So, uh, you know, I just think because we, I, I had an opportunity to ask Matt Painter, like, how do you make, like, you're going to give the mid range game they have for years. This is nothing new to their defensive scheme with their drop coverage with Zach Eady. But how do you make life difficult? doing that and i thought in the first half camden heidi braden smith lance jones when they're getting screened and they're coming off their screen like you got to do you got to be a little more aggressive trying to get back to your shooter you know i understand it's not an easy task but just i need a little uh, just a tad more intensity trying to get back to your guy because these guys i felt were way too comfortable you know um with some of their mid-range shots in the first half and then in the second half you know, things started to close up and, and painter talked about that being a law of averages and they want them to have that shot. Now. I also think when you're talking about the mid range game, when it's a close game or you're leading, like you have more confidence to shoot that. But then as Purdue starts to extend the lead and you're getting to tw 10, 12, 13 and, and twos, you're trading twos for threes, you know, or, or how, and the lead just keeps extending. Like now all of a sudden, those two point mid range game shots, you know, have a little more pressure to them because if you're trying to stay in the game, you got to knock, you know, a good majority of them down. And I think that's what happened in the second half is as Purdue started to extend the lead that made those mid ranges a little more important for Grambling state. And that made them have a little more pressure against the shot. And that's what caused, you know, the percentages to start to fall. And, and I just wanted to add, cause like, I think there's always a lot of talk of that is what Purdue gives up is those mid range shots. And there is degrees of how well they, they defend those shots still. Right. And I think we would agree for the first half, it wasn't great. Second half is much better. Um, but like, it's not always as, as simple. I think as sometimes people think of like, well, just like, why are you giving up the mid range? Well, maybe back in like the seventies and, and just like, and that's not even a shot of the seventies. It's just like players have so much improved. Like even just compared to 10 years ago, especially in the offensive, you have like you have guys from from 10 years old having skill trainers now. Uh, um, and, and this is just like what they do. They play offense and like 
I mean, we've even, I think it's becoming more and more common too. Like you see these 14, 15, 16 seeds, like uh, Craig put out a tweet. It's just like, these, these are diff, these are more talented teams. Um, and so, yes, you're giving up mid-range shots and you can defend them better, but like offenses are too good, even at the college level to take away every single thing. Like you have to give up something. It's just players are too good, too skilled, too good of shooters um, to take away literally everything on defense every time. And that's where you, you painter is decided. And a lot of it is the analytics and, and just like understanding like, Hey, mid range shots. They are one of the tougher shots in the game. They also just give the other team the least amount of points. That is what we're going to give up. Like I said, they can still defend that at better. Right. And that first half, I don't think they were great at it. Um, and they improved in that second half, but it isn't always as simple as just like, well, take away the mid range. It's that's that's what they they do because if they aren't given to if they are taking away the mid range, that probably means they're giving up at the rim. Um, and maybe Ed is good enough that he can get back and contest there. But oftentimes, that's you know, like just thinking logically, you'd rather have a guy shoot a fifteen foot pull up rather than try and get something at the rim. So that was what I wanted to add there. Um, just just offenses these days, even at even at the college level, just are too good to take away every single thing every single time. And the other thing is, you know, when they started to make more defensive stands and get better against that mid range, is they brought Edie up a step higher or two um, in that coverage and pushed him out a little bit further to contest. And I personally just think that, I mean, obviously Painter talked about the fact that they needed to be better in the first half, but it was primarily talking about the guards getting over the screens because that's how they're going to approach that with drop coverage. But when they have Zach step up another step or two uh, to contest on that. I think they're much more comfortable doing that when they get through a first half and he's still only got one foul um, just so that they know he's safe and ready to go. You saw him in the first 10 minutes of the game. Um, he got beat and it was a shot. He definitely could have contested and just kind of, just kind of let it go because he's too important and too valuable um, to worry about contesting one shot at the rim that early in the game and taking the chance of having to go sit on the bench for eight minutes. So I think they get a touch more aggressive with how they play Zach against those, um, you know, kind of mid range shots in the second half as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point, Craig, because a couple times that Zach did step up into, to try to hedge the shot, the guys then drove on Zach and a couple of nice drives in the first half and, and made the bucket and used the hoop to kind of block Edie as they did like a reverse layup. And then there were, you know, the couple fouls that Zach did pick up were guys getting past him. And then, you know, a little hesitation, Zach gets up in the air and now you give a little body contact and it's, and it's a foul and, 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 you know, Grambling State was going to the free throw line. So to your point, you know, I definitely think that that's something that has to be taken into consideration as how much you want to come up into it, because now you're you're giving up that angle to the rim. Although I was pretty surprised the couple times they did try to take it at Zach that they were able to make those buckets. But that's what happened last year at this very moment. That's what they were doing. They were going right at Zach and completing, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, making the bucket on him inside the paint, which you don't see that much. You don't see that many teams try to go at Zach Eady. And honestly, if I were them, I mean, you got nothing to lose, you know, why not try that? But, you know, that's only going to work for so long, you know, as the fouls stack up and everything else. So, you know, you're, you're only going to be able to dip into that well so many times. And then you saw that in the second half, Zach Eady started swatting everybody that was coming in his area. Um, you know, and that's, that was a lot of fun to watch in the second half as well. Yeah, I don't know how he ended up with only three blocks. I, I felt like a lot more. Um, and that was just what he did in the second half defensively. Like, it was, the defense started being a little bit better because even like, um, like somebody just commented, like, Lance Jones wasn't good defensively. And I agree for the first like 20, 25 minutes. Then when they, when the momentum starts going, I, I thought Lance was part of that, of he was finally getting through screens and, and finally forcing tougher looks. Part of that's Edie as well. Um, so it was just, it was good to see, it was good to see the second half Purdue do what they needed to do, right? It, we're not, it's not like I'm like, oh man, this is like some revolutionary stuff and, and all that. It's like, no, this is what you're supposed to do against scrambling. And they did it. Um, even like after a somewhat shaky first half, they win by 28. Like that's just, also that's kind of what happens in tournament. How many, how many tournament games have been like, Oh, it's, you know, the 14, 15, 16 seed. They're like hanging around for 20 minutes and then they lose by like 30. Yeah. I said to a few people, it was the most stressful 30 point win I've ever watched. And and it just did. I didn't like, I know people, some people, you know, they want to get into the, the X's and O's like we're doing now, but like, that's for me, like as somebody that's at the game and, and I don't know how many people are watching that were at the game, but like, those are the vibes we felt and, 
So like, to me, those are some of the things that, that, that I really monitor. And, and so I know some people were frustrated with some of the things I was saying, but I, I mean it, I just, I want there to be a more, a higher energy. Cause you saw it in the second half, everybody was going nuts, you know, as Zach was getting the blocks and they're going up and down and Lance Jones hits a big three and they start to extend and, and now everybody's getting up. And, and so that, that to me is, is where I want this to be on Sunday as they take on either TCU or Utah state or a tied right now uh 20 well it's actually 28 to 26 now TCU just took the lead with 6 minutes to play i did want to reverse this now or or take this to a different direction cuz the other observation i had in this game um that i want to see change here on sunday and i don't know how how overstated this is but like jb asking the chat can gillis have an off game I, I, and and to me i don't know how well you guys thought he played but the thing that bugged me was he was hesitant on shots and doing the pump fake when I felt like he should have been ripping it in moments that I've been, that I feel like I've seen him this season shoot with a little more confidence. I don't know from your guys' standpoint, how you felt, but that was one thing as the game was kind of still in the balance where it was like, you know, I just need Mason to do what he's done all season. And that's be the third best three point shooter in the big 10, or at least during big 10 play. Uh, you know, grip that and rip it, man. Don't think about it. When you're open, take that shot because they need him to to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, um, he had a little bit of hesitancy. I don't think that's like I don't think that's gonna be indicative of how he's necessarily gonna play. I, I think it was just an off night. Like the last time Mason Gills did not make a three in a game, you have to go back to February eighteenth. Um, he went 0 for 1. And then it's like the every game since then. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 straight games. He's hit at least two threes and he shot at least 40% from three. Um, I think it was more of an off night. And, and Jones looked like he had to get out jitters. I think Gillis kind of just had to work it through it too. Um, I'm still super confident. And, and I think like if we notice that, Painter notices that. And, and Gillis, I guarantee you Gillis notices or will notice it after the game too. And, and the coaching staff will be on him be like, shoot the ball shoot the ball. You're good. Shoot the ball. Um, so I'm like, I think it's a very fair point for this game specifically, but I personally don't think it's like, I, I still have all the confidence in the world for Gills going forward. Yeah, no doubt. And um, I, I mean, I guess I really thought there was only one shot where I was like, pull it, pull it, pull it. The rest of them, um, there, I mean, there was a couple times he pump faked and then decided to pass it. And I didn't necessarily think those were bad decisions because they ended up getting a better shot maybe out of it. Uh, but there was definitely that one time that we we all saw and we're like, oh, come on now. Like, like, just rip it, man. Just pull it. But I like this guy over to the left of me said, uh, I think the, he'll certainly keep doing that going forward. But I want to maybe transition over and talk Cam Heidi just a little bit here because I, I thought he was really impressive for as much as we've talked about, um, you know, Lance and and Miles and him um, having to get that first game experience in a tournament. And, you know, TKR, Braden and Fletch only in their second game in that tournament. You know, um, I don't think Cam showed any jitters at all. He kind of you know, that first three point attempt was a little bit off, but still a pretty clean look, still a pretty good shot. And that didn't phase him one bit. He pulls two more threes, only hits one of them, but connects on one out of three, um, has a nice little drive to the rim. I think he collects um, only collected three rebounds. It felt like he did a lot more than that. But when we asked Painter about the, or when they asked Painter about kind of those new players getting into the game and getting those jitters out of the way, he really emphasized just how good Cam was on both ends of the floor, uh, but especially defensively when they were trying to find some answers. Um, that's a longer, more athletic wing that they can bring in to make things a little bit tougher on shorter, quicker guards because he's still fast enough to stay with those guys and recover. Um, and he painter thought he did a really nice job on that end. And I think that was pretty apparent, you know, in the off season, he talked, um, ad nauseum about the fact that they got more athletic by bringing in miles, by bringing in cam and how, and bringing in Lance and how that was going to be important, um, come tournament time because athleticism is what's burned this team. Um, playing against some teams that aren't the quality that Purdue is, but there's that gradient of you've got these really big dudes on Purdue that are a little bit slower sometimes, and you've got these super quick, super athletic guards coming out of some of these smaller conferences that can kind of kind of burn you on that just from a stylistic standpoint, and they needed to get more athletic. And in a game where you had a bunch of athletic guards um, that were getting to that mid-range and in some cases getting all the way to the bucket in that first half, 
you saw him ride Miles and ride Cam to a total of what did it end up being at? Cam plays 22 minutes, Miles plays 12, so that's 34 minutes. I would challenge you to go back in the schedule and find a quote important game um, where those two played more than 34 minutes this year, maybe Alabama, but I feel like cam didn't play that many minutes in Alabama and miles did. So I, he rode those two a lot today. He even rode with some extra athleticism against this particular team. Yeah. I, you know, for me, it's, it's almost kind of bizarre how much, run now miles is getting and it's very reminiscent of brandon newman who didn't play all of big 10 play and then at the end of the year started getting minutes it, it kind of reminds me of that i know they have different maybe different roles to an extent um but it, it, it to me is a little bizarre and so like i loved in the second half when miles colvin almost threw that down going coast to coast like if he had finished that dunk that would have been unbelievable and when he he if he he showed right there the kind of athlete and like potential he can have you know if if you know painter's gonna let him get out and run and spread his wings uh you know in the first half you know he was in there um yeah i'd be lying if i said i'm not nervous when he's in there i am i'm just not used to seeing him in there he's i'm not used to seeing him in the rotations and now you're putting him in in what i consider huge minutes you know the game the, the season is on the line and and he hasn't played all year. And so I'm ex I'm excited that Painter thinks, okay, he's ready now. He's ready for these minutes. He's, you know, I think from Painter, we know you know the kind of coach he is. He's obviously earned those minutes through practice. And so that's great. But you know, the one where he, he put the three up in the first half, you know, he, obviously we all know he's ready to he's he's green light ready at all times. Uh, but at the same time, and then and then in the second half at one point. He got the ball. And you're just like, settle down, settle down, settle down. And he did. He eventually got it into the big and they got the bucket. But I, I'm still kind of at that moment where like, hey, if he's going to throw one down like he almost did, great. But like the rest of it, I'd be lying personally if I didn't say I'm like entirely nervous when he's out there just because I'm just not used to seeing him out there yet. So I don't know what he's going to do. And at one point when in the second half, he was in the corner near the Purdue bench and they're getting ready to run their set. And someone had to tell miles like, Hey, you're coming around the curl for the handoff. Like when they do, you know, that action, the, the Chicago action where a couple guys come around, somebody had to tell him like, go, you know? And so like, to me, those are some of the moments where I'm like, well, you know, it, when he hasn't played all year to then put him into that moment and, and then, you know, there's a little bit of communication that needs to be had to make sure he's on the same page. I'm, I'm, it's just, I'm nervous. That's all I'm going to say. I'm excited for his potential, but I am nervous. That's all I'm going to, that, that's where I'm at with it. But the reason that he's getting run now is because he's not making bad decisions. Like in, in the last three games, I can think of maybe one shot attempt that I, I thought was a bad decision at that time. Um, you saw multi Joe and I looked at each other a couple of different times, like, oh, he didn't pull it. Like he had a he had enough space for what Miles needs, and he shot fake and he feeds TKR and TKR gets a bucket. Like he's making the right decisions. He's understanding where to be from a rotation standpoint on defense more. Yeah, they still got to maybe tell him how to set here or there, but like I've seen juniors and seniors on this team with as many sets that Painter has that that players have had to be like, yo, dude, you know, like that's fair. It's you. Let's go. go. Let's go. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll jump in here. This was Miles Colvin's career high in assist. He had three and the one specifically that and was just like that mid range pull up where it was like he probably could have forced. He throws it into Edie. Edie gets a I don't know if he got a dunk or a layup or whatever. Uh, just really good decision making. The defense, I don't like the defense has been better. I'm not saying he's like, I don't think he's still like elite, but it's better where it's not like an hinder, a hindrance. And then the other quiet thing, because right, Colvin is now kind of getting these Morton minutes, right? Heidi's Heidi's clearly took first wing off the bench. Miles is kind of taking these Morton minutes is like the first half brain wasn't great defensively, but like brain's been much better defensively the past four, five, six games. I'm going to kind of exclude the big 10 tournaments because of reasons. Um, and it doesn't fit my narrative. So, um, <laughs> But I, I think that also helps too, where like you don't have to go to Morton and now you can bring in Colvin for kind of this 
offensive look, right? We know what Colvin can do offensively. He can come in. Yes, he goes over two today, whatever. He can come in and drill three threes at any given moment. Um, but it, it's all that. It's He's doing those little things. He's not... Um, he, you know he's being in the right spot for the most part defensively he's making much better decisions that combined with bright and improved brain smith defensively like that's where I, I think you see more of these miles minutes is just like you might as well bring in that that kind of offensive power because um you're not you know you're, you're not giving up so much defensively that it isn't worth it well, we've got, um, uh, muted you knew it was happening at some point. Uh, we got about two and a half minutes left here in the first half of the TCU Utah State game. 37 35 Utah State with the lead. Uh, so, two and a half minutes left of game action before we get to halftime, and then what, like 5, 10, 15 minutes of halftime. So, we're going to start to try to get to third base, round third base here on the show because um, we think, um, you know, we, we'd like to watch the second half just to kind of get an idea of what. Purdue's up against here on Sunday, and we're all excited for it. Some people did ask, you know, like, hey, where's the meetup going to be, uh, or are we going to meet up? And and I did, um, I did highlight it. I thought somebody was asking, like, hey, where? We? So we're going to do the same thing as we did today, time dependent. We got to see what time the game is on Sunday, and based off of that time. We do plan on kind of doing the same routine that we did today. We were at the Hooters. That's literally right down the street. What street is that on? Um, Georgia Street, I believe. Yeah, it's on Georgia Street, and it's a, it's literally a block from the stadium. Um, we've had some pretty good success there as far as just having enough tables and room for everybody to hang out. I know the, the Boiler fan contingent was at Brothers, but it was packed to the nines if you were there today. Uh, and I'm sure a very fun atmosphere, but we kind of wanted to go somewhere where we could hang out and talk ball and stuff. So, um, you know, uh, come Sunday – just come on over there, whatever time the game is. We're going to, I'm going to be there early. I'm not sure what these guys are going to do, but we're going to do our best to go there. The people that were there today, we kind of talked about kind of running it back and keep the mojo going the same. And um, so everybody wear the same socks, shoes, shirts. Everybody don't shower until Sunday. Like just do whatever you did today. And like, I'm very superstitious. I don't know if you can tell, but uh, we'll be at the Hooters on Georgia Street before the game on Sunday. But, you know, just, Keep an eye on the time and stuff and keep an eye on updates on Facebook and Twitter as well. I had um I, I got nothing to add there. So if we were trying to add on to that, then then you guys should No, 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 we're good. I, I just, like I said, let's round third yep. now here on the post game show. Like I said, two minutes and thirty eight seconds on the first half, and then we got a little bit of time in between halftime, but obviously we want, we want to get all this wrapped up and get our equipment um put away. Uh, so wherever you guys want to go with this, I, I definitely thought Camden Heidi was a lot of fun to watch here today. That that alley oop dunk was as good as it gets. Like just that kind of confidence, and and you know he missed his first three, and then he made his second. Uh, so you saw that comfort kind of start to set in for him. So wherever you guys want to take this, we haven't talked about Braden, we haven't talked about Fletcher. So if we, we want to kind of go there, we can. Wherever you guys want to go, though. I mean, we talked. I think we talked about Braden a good bit. That was. I wanted to go to Fletcher really quick. And was this like you know big game Fletcher or anything like that? No. Um. And I don't even think he took one shot attempt in the second half. Defensively, I think there was twice. Um. And I don't know. I I, I don't know if Grambling State just went away from it for some reason or, or if Purdue just stopped switching. But there was. I'm getting. I'm getting way sidetracked from what I was originally going to say. But we're going to go with it. Um. In the second half, Purdue was, or Grambling State was running this kind of like pin down where it was Braden's. Smith's guy, Dozier, pinning down a lawyer, and, and um, they were, or no, it was switched, sorry. Lawyer's guy was pinning down for Brain Smith's guy, and then they were switching that off ball, and then you saw twice Dozier just catch it and go at lawyer. Um, aside from that, though, I, I thought it was a pretty solid defensive game from lawyer. More importantly, in the midst of that first half where it's a little shaky, uh, it's, you know, Purdue isn't getting out to this gigantic lead. There was a couple moments that Fletch hit, they hit, he hit two big time threes. Um, and like I said, he didn't, you know, he goes three for four on the day, two of two from three, but uh, that was those threes, especially those were big time threes in, in pretty big moments, I think, to just help give, you know, bring Gamebridge to life, help give Purdue that little bit of comfort, a little bit of space. So um, was it like an A plus game from lawyer? Probably not. You know, it, it wasn't this gigantic game, but I think he did things in big moments that were pretty important. Um, and that that's kind of all I just kind of wanted to say about Fletch. Yeah, and I guess just to add on to that really quick, um, I thought he kind of was big game Fletch because had this game gotten tied at some point, the the level of stress and nervousness changes in this game. 
And a couple of those threes were, I know one of them, the game had gotten down to four uh, when he buries one of those threes. Like I, I thought when he hit some of those shots specifically, um, the drive to end the half to extend it to nine, like he just did things to me to, to not let that lead get too close uh, to where everybody starts puckering up a little bit. So I, I thought he was a little bit of big game Fletch in the, in the first half, even though he only really took a handful of shots. And quietly, like the thing that's quietly forgot about last year after you, and, and we should never talk about that game ever again, but like Fletch was the one guy that aside from Edie, that was hitting from the perimeter. He finished three for eight, but I believe he chucked like had to pretty much just chuck two right at the end. Um, like we, we know that that Fletch is built for these moments, but even last year um, in, in, we like I said, we'll, we're done with that game. But he was a guy that stepped up still in that game, at least knocking down shots. He's never afraid of the moment. He showed it here today, like you said. Yeah, and you know it's seven point game to end the first half, and then Fletcher drives to the rack and gets that two. Sounds silly, but like that's just I'm sorry. There was there was vi- there was bad vibes going into the halftime tunnel, and to make that shot at the end, just to make it to nine, you know, and then obviously they start out the second half hot and and really kind of put the game away early in the second half as they should, but that was a big bucket. And, 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 you know, the other thing too about Fletcher, and I think you guys talked about it, or I think maybe Craig put this on Twitter, but like they had, you know, X amount of missed shots, you know, but they were all offensive. Re- they were rebounded offensively off those missed shots. And some of those were kickouts. I'm pretty sure all of Fletcher's threes were on kickouts off of offensive rebounds. So those are also backbreakers where, the team thinks they're getting a stop. Purdue gets the rebound, wide open shooter, bang down the well, it goes. And so that, you know, not only is from an extending the league standpoint, but, you know, where the other team thought they were getting a stop and they don't. No, that, that, that I think is also the other aspect of why Fletcher's shots are so big when they happen. Yeah, I, I think that I think that is fair. Um, the only guy I guess we really haven't touched on if we want to is TKR. He finishes with 11 points, seven rebounds, four of them offensive, two assists, two turnovers. He did not shoot the ball well to start, um, but did get it going. I know it was in less meaningful minutes, but did find the touch kind of late. Um, he missed He missed some layups. I, I got nothing to say other than he missed some layups. Um, but the good thing for me to see was just that he continued being aggressive defensively, or not defensively, on the, on the offensive glass. Um, and... That's kind of what we've said. I, I think T has morphed into this. Just like when he's in, he's just got to be attacking the glass, attacking the glass, attacking the glass. You're hoping that he gets some of those layups and little floaters to go. Um, he obviously didn't st- to start, but he did to finish the game. Did a pretty good job defensively. Not that Grambling, I mean, Grambling State wasn't really using their wings that much, but uh, you know, I, I don't got too much to add other than I was just happy to see him continue to attack the boards. Yeah, let's let's give Tammy a shout out from the super chat. Um, thank you, Tammy, for the super chat said, you guys are amazing. And thanks for your efforts. I want to just kind of add on to not just thanking Tammy, but, uh, ran into a lot of people just as we were down here today, uh, both at the meetup, but then while we were in the stadium coming into the arena, uh, leaving the arena to come down to here that, that came up and talked to us and thanked us for what we do. Um, I was riding down the elevator and somebody said, we're getting on the show as soon as we get to the car that I'd never met before and just said, thank you. So that, that means a lot to all of us. I know, uh, means a lot to me. Um, and, and we do this because you guys like to listen to it and we love covering Purdue basketball, but, um, all of you guys mean a lot to us and certainly we appreciate it. hundred percent. I hope everybody comes out, to Hooters on Sunday, uh, the classiest of establishments, but I promise like you get, it's a good, it's a good spot. Cause it's like I said, it's right down the street from the stadium and plenty of space for us to all hang out and you get your food and drinks pretty quick. Cause it's not as packed maybe as other bars. We were never going to kill Roy's that wasn't on the table. Uh, that's an IU bar, but uh, yes, you're hundred percent right, Craig. It was, it's very humbling to meet everybody and, and, and people that appreciate what we do. We appreciate them a lot more uh, for, for enjoying what we're trying to do here. So, uh, yeah, once again, hit that like button, uh, subscribe if you have it. I know a lot of people watch on Twitter and Facebook, but for those of you that are coming over to our YouTube channel, subscribing and, and liking the show there really helps us from an algorithm standpoint more so than the other platforms. Uh, and, and you can watch it however, whatever makes you comfortable. But that certainly helps us as far as growing what we're trying to do here. So if you go over to YouTube, 
Braggs and Braggs in the stands is the main channel because I cover some Chicago sports as well. But if you also, you know, go in there uh, and then you can see all the boilers in the stands shows in our library and, and like the show, subscribe to the channel. It helps all of us out immensely. So we appreciate you guys so much. Uh, so we're getting close to wrapping this thing up. Like I said, we, we were going to do about an hour and, and then get to the second half and enjoy the game like the rest of you guys. Uh, but you're right about Trey Kaufman, right, man? Um, really, really active. Uh, that 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 dunk he had where he – I mean, he's just so good at feeling the defender's body and then that dictating the move he's going to put on his defender. And that time he gave him you know, the, the baseline and the drop. And he took it, hooked him, went around, bang, and and, and it was a pretty nasty dunk. They had to call a timeout there. Uh, that was a big moment in the game that I think really lifted the energy in the stadium. Um, you know, so that was a big um, – Lynn Ream in the chat saying, buy buy me a ticket, Braggs, and I'll be loud. All right. You know, we'll st- if I, if I got to pay for everybody's ticket in this stadium, uh, I'll do it if I have to. Just don't tell Jenny. <laughs> but um, – so yeah, let's let's get to uh, the final thoughts. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if there's anything else from a personnel standpoint or anything, you know, X's and O's wise that you guys want to touch on. If not, we can, you know, have our final thoughts or or get to some of these highlighted chats that we can run through here real quick. What's whatever you guys want to do? Game game ball. Game balls. Um, Zach Eady. There you go. <laughs> Braggs, you go next. But no, Craig's got Zach. Who do you got? Do you? Um, I mean, it's it's got to be Braden. A lot like ten assists, zero turnovers is wild. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of I think role players that deserve probably that. But for if if Edie's gone, I, Braden is just it just has to be Braden. It has to be Braden. I'm gonna go with Camden Heidi. Uh, what did he end up finishing with? Um, Eight points, three rebounds, two of them offensive, one assist. One, one assist. Steal. Yeah, plus, I mean, you know. Plus 17 in 22 minutes. Plus 17, you know. Um, yeah, I think Camden Heidi, his first ever tournament game, knocks down a three, the alley-oop dunk, showing off that uh, athleticism, you know, uh, staying with his guy defensively. You know, he's he's an X factor, and I think as he gets going, uh, more in his career, he's 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 a you know a guy that could potentially be a star here. You know, in his third and fourth year, uh, he's got a lot to his game and a lot of confidence here, and and his minutes continue to grow. And so I'm giving my ball to Camden Heidi. Bonus ball time for me because um, you're talking about about a, st- a potential star here, at Purdue, and, and there is a star, and, and Shancocks they they have it. It is it is Carson Barrett. I'm telling you, he is a hooper. He is a hooper. Fadeaway three contested. Um, you know, near the end of the game, um, just like this is this is who Carson Barrett is. Like I, all joking aside, the the dude's actually a hooper. And, and if he wanted to go play like a lower D one or D two, he would have got big minutes there. Um, obviously, you know. He wanted to to live out the the Purdue dream and respect that, but uh, the the dude's actually good. Like he he is very very good at basketball. So bonus game ball that goes to him. Yeah, that's a great one. And like I said, I I told the story quickly earlier, but there's this guy two rows behind me. Like the game's over, last four minutes of the game, and he's losing it with every bucket going back and forth. And now I'm starting to realize that he has the under on the twenty six and a half. And so I'm quietly kind of rooting against this because he's like rooting for Purdue to not score points. So now I'm like, all right, now I want this guy to not get it. And so it gets to 24 points and, and Carson Barrett knocks down the three and it, and then, and then uh Grambling state held the ball and, 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 and they actually ended up shooting a shot, but it was like an air ball to end it. But <laughs> It was one of the funnier moments watching, you know, and that's why I'm not a gambler because I got enough to stress about with the game as it is. And then you got, then you also are stressing whether the over is going to hit or the under, like, come on, I, I can't do it. So, uh, but yeah, that's funny with Carson, Carson Barrett. Shout out to you. Final shot. Jeff Parks. He's giving, he says chat over rules. Uh, Coach Matt Painter gets the game ball. All right. Fair enough. Uh, good job by Matt Painter here today with his adjustments in the second half. Uh, so yeah, just a few starred comments. I'll get through here real quick. If there's anything you guys want to chime in on it, but Ben Smith said, sounded like the crowd was full of Boilermaker fans. 
what would you guess the percentage was? I mean, it was literally 98% to 2% grambling. And as I said earlier, I just need, I need more energy from the 98%. It's going to be the same way here on Sunday. As far as uh, fans outweighing, I just, I, I need, the, I need the juice. I need the juice. I really do. Um, Jay says we are relying on ED way too much. Uh, hey, you know, that's what you're going to do when he's the player year. And you, and you have to, because he, you know, he's going to draw so many fouls as well. I get, you know, you, you may not, love how you're throwing it into him every time, but at the same time, that's a war of attrition that you're winning every single game. Go ahead, Joe, if you got something. Like, the other guys made shots. Why wouldn't you? I guess just like, why wouldn't you? Like, what could? What did they show that they could stop Edie? If things were happening, like, and that's the difference between this year and last year. If Edie is stopped, they have Brighton, Fletch, Lance, Heidi now, Gillis, Colvin, TKR even, like, and I literally named the whole rotation. They have other guys that can score and, and do what they need to do. So um, you go to Edie until he can be stopped, and then you figure it out from there. Well, and the biggest thing is they were guarding him one-on-one -on -one today. So, like, as long as they are going to do that, they're going to throw it to Zach. Um, if they're going to double, then it's going to be a game where a lot of other guys are taking shots. But if it's one-on-one, -on -one, you throw it to Zach, and you let him keep going until he gets to 40. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll start to wrap this up here. Uh, how many minutes for Braden, Joe? Sally's asking. 34. 34 minutes for Braden. That, and, and that was something we didn't touch on. Like, how healthy did you guys think he looked? That was a big talking point going into the game. He looked, he looked healthy to me. I didn't seem like that was a concern once the game was going on. Nope. Yeah, he had the burst getting downhill if he needed it. Um, he just didn't need it a lot today. Uh, yeah, I he may not be physically 100%, but he was playing like he was 100% to me. Crisis averted in the Big Ten tournament. Dead Hoosier. Purdue radio broadcast rules. Only way to watch the game is with Blackman and Bobby Buckets, our guy. 100% uh, agree with you there, Dead Hoosier. Andy Nepp. First game I saw no fresh, no freshman in Coleman. Came in determined. Um, like I said, if he had thrown down that dunk, that would have brought the whole house down. Uh, ben Smith, props to Coach Matt Painter for knowing that Morton's defense wasn't needed tonight against Grambling and riding Colvin and Heidi instead. Either of you have any thoughts to that? No, I, I kind of said him before. I, I think the defense steps up elsewhere. Um, Heidi's been good. You don't need to go to Morton just because, just because of how much space he gives up offensively. When, when Purdue's offense is designed on space, and timing and more his defender can kind of interrupt that. So no, I think that was, it was just a good decision. I, I like it. Um, yeah, hundred percent. So, all right, a few more here. JB asked, should I cheer for Gonz Gonz Kansas or G I almost said Gonzaga, Kansas or Gonzaga tomorrow? Who are you guys rooting for? Um, I am worried about TCU or Utah state. I will worry about that after we went on Sunday and I really don't care which of those two teams win. I think Purdue handles either one of them. All right, let's go. I like the mentality. One game at a time. Boilermaker for life. Only five wins left. Boiler up. One game at a time, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, Aaron Jackson saying, ha ha, why pass to Jordan in the 90s? Yeah. You want to go to the guys that are going to get you buckets. Uh, Sydney asking here in the chat. We appreciate you, Sid. 91 thumbs up. 91 likes. Can we get to a hundred? We appreciate everybody tuning in. Please hit that like button. If you're watching in YouTube, it's called a like spike. Hit that like button right now on your way out. As we wrap things up here, uh, final observations here as Utah state leads 43, 37 at the half from a few people in our chat, JB saying TCU, more aggressive guards, Utah state has a big who can shoot outside. And, uh, Tariq Kamal saying, um, Utah State's zone defense looks tough. Um, so what say you guys about those two observations regarding our upcoming opponent? I haven't watched them a ton. I really haven't. Um, I'll, we'll go out there, and, and then I'll have better analysis, and I'll have a preview up of whoever wins. But, um, yeah, I, I truly just can't give too many thoughts right now on it because I haven't seen them enough. Yeah, I mean, they asked Painter in the post game, and Painter said he couldn't give too many thoughts because he hadn't watched them yet either. Um, his assistants have. That's what he said. He said, go interview my assistants, and they can tell you. 
Uh, but I need to I need to spend a little bit of time watching both of them as well. So I don't have any thoughts about what may be more difficult or which team might be a little bit better. All that really matters right now is there are five single game tournaments left. And Purdue just has to focus on each one of those individually over the next five games until they pull the trophy up in their hand. 100%. So James Madison, Wisconsin was about to make it a game. It was 52 to 46, and Kleshmet hit a missed a wide open layup, and then James Madison turned around and hit uh, a three on the other end. So now it's 55 to 46 as Wisconsin heads to the free throw line with seven minutes and 30 seconds left in the game. Uh, 105 likes, Sid. We appreciate you getting us over 100 as we end this show. Uh, see if Wisconsin can come back here. I know Nebraska lost, so that was one Big Ten team that went down. Uh, Northwestern won in dramatic fashion. So Big Ten trying to do what they can to, 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 to change the narrative around here and Purdue's trying to change some narratives as well. So that wraps things up here tonight. We'll be back on Sunday. We got a little bit more. We didn't really know how our process was going to work tonight, so – uh, thank you for everyone bearing with us as we uh, kind of got our ducks in a row trying to figure out how we're going to do this. But, uh, yes, you can see here, this is how we're doing it here at Boilers in the Stands. We are sneaking into the John Wooden press conference room. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. And um, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. So we just came in here. This is our house, um, the house that Jordan once owned. Craig, thank you very much. You don't like that little shot, do you? Uh, but, no, we appreciate the hospitality of the Pacers people. Uh, we are not putting me on solo because then I will just go on to a rant of Midwestern goodbyeness. So enjoy the second half of TCU Utah State. If you're coming up, dead Hoosier, boiler up, see you all on Sunday. I hope we see you. Come out to Hooters on Georgia Street. We will be there early hanging out. Make sure you come out. Come say hi. If you want to yell at me for my fan take, go right ahead. I'm going to be yelling at you guys that come to the game to get loud on Sunday. Make this place Mackey Arena. I cannot emphasize that enough. Need the juice. Need the energy. Back our boys. Let's use that home court advantage that they earned and help them out and give that home court advantage that they deserve. This is a fun team. That's been a lot of fun to cover the last few years. Let's see how it finishes out. Let's see if we can get to Detroit. It's going to be a lot of fun. So hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you to everybody here in the chat. Thank you to Craig Bowers. Thank you to Joe Jackson. Um, so we will see you here Sunday afternoon. Boilers win. See you Sunday. And always boiler up.